David Knight in Austin, and I'm joined by Paul Joseph Watson in the UK. We've been talking about his article yesterday that's picked up on the Drudge Report about a Florida woman whose home was raided, and she and her boyfriend were stripped naked by the police, handcuffed, and held for a couple of hours without explanation. And although they had a search warrant, the question is, is this the way we want to live in our society? Because we see this happening to innocent people all the time. And even whether or not the people are innocent, we see them, uh, we see innocent casualties. Many times they raid the wrong place or the wrong people. They have, uh, sometimes they don't have a search warrant. We were just talking before the break about The Guardian, how both people on the left and the right are starting to wake up to this militarization. This is an article that just came out uh, yesterday. U.S. police departments are increasingly militarized, finds a report. And this is The Guardian talking about an ACLU report. Interestingly enough, in the bullet point items here, as they say, ACLU cites a soaring use of war zone equipment and tactics. SWAT teams increasingly deployed in local police raids. Seven civilians killed and 46 injured in incidents since 2010. You see how even our language is talking about this as if it is a military occupation, as if we've got some kind of asymmetric warfare going on, fighting insurgents in our own country. Even they talk about civilians. And this is something that it actually crept into the lexicon in, in America. I think uh, first noticed it in the movies back in the 1970s where they're talking about civilians. And they kind of did it as a, I took it as a joke at the time, but it's not a joke. And so now here we are 30 years later, you've got publications like The Guardian talking, sounding like the John Birch Society. They were sounding the alarms on this decades ago and of course still are sounding the alarm so it's it's good to have the left complaining about the militarization of the police and uh, we were just talking to paul joseph watson about this article paul this is an amazing story here about this baby this was about a month ago they they broke in 18 month old baby they threw a flash grenade in landed in the crib and they said uh, as they've got the parents taken down they told him that they'd taken their baby to the hospital they'd only lost a tooth and they wanted him for observation when she got there she found out this is what she said. His face was blown open. He had a hole in his chest that left his rib cage visible. The uh, flashbang grenade had landed in his crib and detonated in his face. She says his, her son is clinging to life. He's hurting and there's nothing I can do to help him. These are insane tactics. And they came in first with the war on drugs. I remember the first SWAT teams were in L.A. about 30 or 40 years ago, and of course they justified it with the war on drugs. Now they're justifying it, and that's still predominantly the way it's running, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, they're justifying it in the case of the militarization of the police, buying the armored tanks and so forth, by saying there's an increase in violence, there's an increase in people with more powerful weapons, we need to you know, get the upper hand. But if you actually drill down into the figures of, of violence and gun crime and so forth, they're not going up. They're going down in most cases. So, you know, you ask what, what is the real reason behind this tooling up, behind treating Americans as terrorists or drug dealers, as you said. And, of course, we had the story the other day about the 90-year-old veteran, World War II veteran, who refused to go to hospital. The police were called. They um, beanbag grenaded him to death. So, again, another outrageous abuse. But... Why are they employing military tactics against civilians? Well, I think it's because they're, they're preparing for domestic dislocation and civil unrest. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a story again, this time out of the UK about this, where uh, police have set up this entire town just south of London, where they've got mock buildings, mock streets, et cetera. And they're, they're training to carry on to, to uh, confront angry mobs in riot control situations. Of course, we had the London riots back in 2011. We had massive riots across Europe over the past few years in places like France and Italy. And now we're talking about this possibly happening in the United States. There are several economists who are warning about this based on things like food inflation and a declining economic picture, because I don't think this is going to be born out of political grievances. It's going to be born out of economic grievances, and it's likely to begin in the poorer areas like Detroit as a result of things like soaring food price inflation. Because if you remember, just last October, we had that EBT card glitch where on their food stamps, they suddenly had no limits for a few hours. It prompted riots in several Walmart stores just for a few hours based on this one glitch. So you can imagine if, if that was dragged out over a matter of days and weeks, which is why people like 
uh, Martin Armstrong, who predicted the 1987 economic collapse, is talking about riots in the poorer areas, areas of America potentially as soon as next year. And he actually uh, wrote a good article entitled, Will Society Ever Wake Up? He makes the point that, quote, the more a society relies upon government, the greater the damage to its economic potential. It requires a control or delete reboot. So he's talking about how dependency fosters instability and ultimately revolution when the system collapses under its own weight. So, you know, when governments become too corrupt to impose this centralized Marxist planning that they promise will be the land of milk and honey for the for the poorer people, um, it collapses because the underclass don't realize that it's a it's a pack of lies until it's too late, which is why they're now talking about potential unrest in 2015. And which is which is why now the police are becoming more militarized in preparation for this situation. One more quote, which I've got in the article today about the British police preparing for riots is that the U.S. Army War College from a white paper from 2008 called Known Unknowns, Unconventional Strategic Shocks in Defense Strategy Development. And it warned that, quote, violent strategic dislocation inside the United States could be provoked by, quote, unforeseen economic collapse, purposeful domestic resistance, pervasive public health emergencies, or loss of functioning political and legal order. It predicted widespread civil violence. So as far back as uh, six years ago, the U.S. Army War College was preparing for these uh, for this civil unrest, this domestic disorder in America. And I think it's going to arise out of worsening economic picture. Yes. And, and uh, other documents that we've seen from them, they also talk about conditions uh, that could bring this on. And one of the ones they mentioned was a collapse of the border, an uncontrolled immigration surge. And of course, they're the ones who are doing it. I look at this and it's we see a massive amount of money that's being made. And of course, in the past, it's the military industrial complex that I believe has fundamentally been behind all these incessant wars we've had all over the world. Now they're bringing that home because they found a new profit center where they can sell these police state surveillance state uh, weapons and tools to local uh, police departments. And it's a very, very dangerous thing. You know, you were talking about the uh, stability and security. One of the quotes that I saw when we were doing research on the Asymmetric Warfare Center before we went out there and looked at that um, uh, facility that they're, they're building to train with, one of the things that they said was the way that you can identify a legitimate or an illegitimate regime, and of course they were talking about the Middle East, was how much security do they need to have in order to get stability? Now, if you use that same yardstick on America, what does that tell you about the legitimacy of our regime? They <laughs> use a lot of security, and they don't see what they're doing and what they're going to be doing as very legitimate because they really are stepping this up now. Exactly, and that's, that's why they're building these fake cities. I mean, mm -hmm. it was $96 million to build this fake city in Virginia. Um, they had a mosque, but they also had a Christian church, remember, a chapel. Yes. You know, all, all the signs were in English. They had the subway. All the signs there were in English. So, again, it's dual use. Yes, it's going to be used to train uh, troops who are going abroad and occupying foreign cities. But when it's when it's all in English and when, of course, as Alex has documented, uh, these urban warfare training drills, they're actually bringing in foreign troops to train them to deal with the American citizens. They had gun confiscation programs aimed at American citizens in those programs. Um, then, you know, it's also going to be domestic. Well, you know, you know, Look Paul, at Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. When we went, uh, even, when, the, even the people who weren't in the line of it, who weren't affected by it, had their guns confiscated yes. after after an emergency. So the, the blueprint is already there to do so again in the future in America. Yes. You're talking about how Americanized it was. I mean, Biggs and I walked through the streets of that town. It was really an eerie experience to walk through this town. Everything was was there, fully functional uh, from the outside. When you go inside the buildings, this unfinished uh, cinder block and everything, but everything on the outside was completely finished. And what was really eerie, I think, to me, was the fact that the the stop signs are still, or stoplights are still cycling. You know, as you're going through it. I mean, it was like a city that had just had some kind of a, a biological attack, and everyone was gone. And I thought, you know, that's something that's very different because always in the past, when they've trained about urban warfare. 
It's always been from the scenario that they came in first with an airstrikes. And so they're essentially going through bombed out shells of buildings and kind of a desert scenario where they're already you've had airstrikes take out the uh, city and they're just going in for an occupation, for a cleanup. But this is very different because here they're going into buildings that are completely intact. I mean, we stood at the corner of First and Main. I took Biggs' picture there. I mean.